y'all. I'm Myrna Santos, and we are back on Dighton's Community Corner for our first visit in four years. We last got together on the Community Corner in September of 2015 in the basement of the Town Hall, and it is hard to believe how fast the time has passed. This program is a brand new beginning for Community, community Corner on Channel 9 in our new meeting spot the refurbished Old Town Hall. Community Corner visits be always begin with a tribute to our nation and those brave men and women, heroes all, who have given of themselves to keep and protect our freedom. This is our time to pause and reflect and realize how fortunate we are to live in the little town of Dighton, Massachusetts in the United States of America, and so I ask that you join with me now in pledging allegiance to the American flag, the flag of freedom recognized around the world. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now I'd like to take just a few seconds of silence to ponder what we just pledged. Thank you all for sharing the pledge with me. Each and every one of us should be proud and grateful to be an American living in this free land. And here we are at Dighton's Community Corner, living the American dream. Today's show will take just a few minutes now to say hello and let you know a bit about what is planned as the program continues and grows. We'll always ask for your input and your suggestions about what you would like to see and hear as this new adventure continues. Community Corner 2019 has a new home with new updated cable equipment and special folks to help us produce more varied types of programs for learning and for fun. As always, this will be a sharing program, but one rule applies as it always has, no politics. We will share Dighton information with a local flavor to help us learn more about our town and its people, covering a time frame of more than 300 years. The town of Dighton holds an important place in our nation's history, and we will touch on that from time to time. We'll talk about who we were, who we are, and what we do. Our government, our businesses, our local organizations, activities and events, and much more. We plan to meet and talk with our officials, get to know our local businesses and organizations. We'll welcome new residents. We want to involve the youth, our kids, who are Dighton and America's future, because we all know that we ourselves won't always be here. So you can contact us easily. Community Corner has a brand new Facebook page, Community Corner Dighton. There is nothing there yet but a name, but there will definitely be more after this program. This will be a sharing program, and our Facebook page will help us to include your input. We want to hear from you, and we welcome your comments and suggestions. There will be soon a monthly trivia time on Community Corner that will share bits and pieces of information just for fun, and we'll have a monthly Did You Know piece about miscellaneous facts, fiction, and curiosities that surround our town and its folks. And there will be one of those before the program closes tonight. If your organization or your church is planning an event, we want to know so we can share it here. Today's program came together very quickly, so there are probably events and happenings that we don't know about here, but we do know that, number one, the Dighton Community Church on Elm Street is sponsoring a huge craft and vendor fair on October 5th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., indoors and outdoors, raffles and prizes. Number two, the Dighton Public Library, in conjunction with the New England First Amendment Coalition, will sponsor a talk the First Amendment and the Free Press in the Old Town Hall right here on October the 10th from 6.30 to 8 p.m. On October 28th, there will be a special town meeting for the town of Dighton at 7 p.m. at the Dighton Middle School. 
The annual arts festival at Arujo Farms on William Street is slated for Sunday, November the 4th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And shuttle transportation to this great event is available at the Mannheim Auto Auction at the north end of William Street. Surprise, we did not expect to have a guest this evening because this program came together very quickly. But we have a very special guest, Mr. Rafa Delphin. A new Daytonian recently moved here. Rafa was the spearhead of the Citizens Committee to save the Captain Nathaniel Crane House. He put a great deal of effort for over a year in trying to do that. Unfortunately, the house was lost, but it was not because he did not do more than anyone could have to try to save it. He has posted a wonderful tribute to that old house on YouTube, well worth your visit, and he can tell us a bit more about that. Rafa has taken a great interest in Dighton's amazing history, and he is now a member and the vice chairman of the Dighton Historical Commission. He has just represented Dighton at an important historic preservation conference, and I know that he will tell us a bit about that and his other efforts regarding Dighton history. Welcome, Rafa. Well, hello, Marina. How are you today? I'm um, very well. And how are you? I'm glad it's a little bit hot in this room. It is a lot hot I'm in this room, actually. <laughs> <laughs> tell us a little about yourself. You have not been in Dighton too many years. No, I actually originally came from San Francisco, the Bay Area, California. Mm -hmm. And after I graduated from, from college um, with a degree in French, I got a teaching position, teaching French at the University of New Hampshire. It was way back in the 1990s. So I flew across the country and lived in New Hampshire for about three years and teaching French. And then I just fell in love with the area. I, I just love the four seasons, the changing of the colors in, in the fall, mm -hmm. which is my favorite season, you know, summer, when, uh, spring, and, and um, fall. fall, of course. <laughs> and, and ever since then, I, I love Massachusetts. I lived in Milton for about 16 years. And then I decided, well, you know, it's time for a change. You know, I sort of got ridden. I didn't want to live the city life anymore, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So I fell in love with the country. And I started, me and my partner, Daniel, started looking for properties around this area. And then we saw this beautiful Second Empire style house on Lincoln Avenue. You know, it's the most beautiful house on Lincoln Avenue. <laughs> so, and I fell in love with it. And we decided, you know, that's the house that I want to live in and die in. And the rest is history. Here I am. So you've been here how long? Three years, December. Two whole years in December. 2016, yeah. And, and your, your house is a very unusual style. Yes, it is. Um, it may be the only one of that style in Dighton. I think so. I, yes, because I've driven around the entire town of Dighton, mm -hmm. and I couldn't find anything that resembles no. more or less my house. No, I don't think so. Yeah. And once again, name that style, because people might be interested. Second Empire. Second Empire yes. style. It was, it was very popular during Napoleon III's uh, reign mm -hmm. in France. So we're talking about the beginning of 1860s to mm -hmm. 1890s. So it has this mansard roofing, yes. side roofing. Yeah. It has this dormer windows. Mm -hmm. uh, it has bay windows on, on the first floor. And it's just beautiful. It's just mm -hmm. beautiful. And I, I love living in that house. Well, that's yeah. a piece of Dighton history in and of itself. Yeah. Do you know when it was built? I believe it was built in 1870s mm -hmm. by an architect by the name of Eugene Rose. And um, I think the, f the first resident was a certain Arthur Hathaway. Uh -huh. And I've done some research about the Hathaways, and they're quite very popular. They were quite very common. They were, they yeah. were, they were very influential. That's a very influential name in mm -hmm. Dighton, no question about that. Among our shipbuilders was a Hathaway. Yeah. And, and so, yes, there's a lot of information <laughs> there. <laughs> okay, well, now you have taken a real interest in Dighton history. Would you like to tell us something about that and maybe a little bit about the Nat Crane House, which is sadly no longer? Well... First things, for, first things first, I probably would not have taken an interest in Dighton history had it not been for you, my dear, <laughs> because you were the one who actually encouraged and inspired me to do some research, uh, to actually take interest in Dighton history, because, I mean, we cannot really know who we are unless we know the past, our mm -hmm. past. Who we've been. And sadly, since you mentioned yourself, you've been living in Dighton, you know, most of your life, that you've seen all the changes that have gone through through the years and not necessarily for the better. 
And, you know, I, I would love to contribute as much as I could in preserving whatever is remaining mm -hmm. of our local culture, heritage, and history. And it's just so sad. So when you mentioned that there was one house owned by the Bristol Aggie School across the street, 130 Sunday Street, which is in that, in that green house, and was, you know, a uh, risk of being demolished if nobody wanted to take it, I took it upon myself to create a citizens' committee to try to save that house from being demolished. And I did everything in my power for a year and a half or so, mm -hmm. um, you know, for that, to preserve that house, but to no avail. And eventually it was demolished on August 28th. August 28th of yeah. 2019, yeah. a banner day because that house dated back prior to 1750, yeah. as did the house just to the east, just to the west of it yes. on, on the hill. Mm -hmm. But the agricultural school did acquire both of those properties, and they are now in the process. Matter of fact, I think the ground the groundbreaking was last Friday. Mm -hmm. They are in the process of putting in a uh, very modern, very beautiful uh, science and technology center where that house stood, mm -hmm. and they will be upgrading their campus. My understanding is that they are looking to expand their, um, their student population from 300 to 600, ultimately, because they service the whole county. However, the loss of that house is something that we can never, ever recover from, and it's, it's too bad that it happened. It had to happen because we couldn't find someone to take it, and if anyone made an effort to do that, you certainly <laughs> did, all over the country. Um, so with that said, where do we go from here? You, you're on the Historical Commission, and you went very recently to a pres preservation conference. I'd be interested to know, and I think people in town would be interested to know what's out there in the line of preservation activity that we can capitalize on? Well, I didn't become a member of the Dinosaur Commission until about maybe six weeks ago. Yeah, it wasn't long. It wasn't long ago. Um, I was invited to attend this uh, Massachusetts um, Historic Preservation Conference that took place in Plymouth last Friday. It was a whole day affair, and I attended uh, three workshops. And one of them included a tour of the historic pilgrimage church, um, which is, is in the process of being restored by the Mayflower Society. Mm -hmm. And when I walked in, into this church, I, I just I was just awed by all the history that surrounded me, um, all the ornate decoration, the, the stained glass windows, it was, it was beautiful. So that was part of the, the workshop. The second uh, uh, session that I attended to was um, about how to find resources to help you in preserving um, whatever building or whatever structure that you're, that you're trying to save. So that was very helpful. I was able to speak with um, town officials from Waitley, is it Waitley? Up north, it's near, um, almost near the New York, Massachusetts border. It's a small little town, about 1,500 people. Yeah. Waitley or Wadley, whatever. And then another, another town north uh, Brookfield? Not Brookfield. North, North Brookfield. Yeah. So these are small towns, but the speakers uh, discussed uh, their, um, you know, what they had done as far as successfully being able to restore their town halls, mm -hmm. which was in, in a rotten shape. And then through aggressive promotion and fundraising and uh, basically begging for money <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> from, from the residents and from uh, applying for grants, they were able to, su to successfully renovate their townhouses, uh, their, ta their town halls, and they're both beautiful. So I would love to be able to try that, you know, thing here in, in Dighton to be able to preserve the segregation school right across the street. The approach for receiving grants yeah. is, a, is a very, very well-used approach, and it does require someone who uh, learns the ins and outs of of doing that. Mm -hmm. there, there's a lot to grant application, and uh, we definitely are, have been working for, well, I have pictures of the former town historian Elaine Varley back in the 1980s working very hard to try to restore the segregated school. And uh, she had donations. There was over $3,000 in an account that wow. was basically donated. Um, but once again, the funding and the lack of, lack of enthusiasm, I think because people didn't realize, I don't think people didn't care. I think 
they didn't realize what we were trying to preserve or what she was trying to preserve at that time. And so the, the schoolhouse, although it was used for many, many years for different organizations, the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, was a police station for a short time. Mm -hmm. um, it, it has been a, a much used town building, uh, fallen into some degree of disrepair. It does have a brand new roof, uh, but we've got a deletting situation over there, which is very, very costly. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually had some volunteers who were willing to help with the deletting. They're licensed de-letters, uh, and, and they were local people. However, uh, because it is a town-owned building, we are required to use prevailing wage in any work we have done, and that increased the cost of the de-letting by tens of thousands of dollars. And so that which, which is, is a lot of money. Yes, yeah. a lot of money. For small town. And yeah. I've I've heard a figure of as much as as fifty or sixty thousand mm. dollars, and that's just a very small one room building. So it that that is something where we need to uh, definitely achieve some fundraising if we can, because the hope. And of, we will do it. Uh, we will do. We will, thank you very will, much. We, we will, will do, do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, the hope of the historical commission has been that they would be able to utilize that building for meetings and so forth. Yes, but also to set it up. We have the original teacher's desk. Mm. We have a number of school desks with all the, uh, you know, the inkwell holes, which we may be able to fill with ink inkwell soon. That's right, yes. Um, due to a donation from someone from another town who knows what we're trying to do. And uh, have programs so that people can go there and actually see how school was conducted mm -hmm. back in the 1800s and, and prior to that. And it holds a special place in my heart because my father attended that school. My dad was born in 1913. And one of his morning jobs on his way to school, everybody walked back in those days, um, was to walk the railroad track to the Dighton Passenger Depot and light the wood stove there wow. for the station master, station master Young, before going to school in the morning. Wow. So there's a special tie to that school. And of course, I attended there as a Girl Scout and so forth too, but not quite the, not quite the same thing. <laughs> but I think, it would be, I think it would be a wonderful experience for today's children, today's kids, to be able to experience you know, going inside and actually maybe dressing up yes. as school children from, from that era. Absolutely. Um, I think it's wonderful because you, you really, sometimes it's hard for, for, for people to imagine history unless mm -hmm. they themselves actually sort of lived in that particular time period. Yes. And I think yeah. um, saving the segregated school it has to be one of our priorities, at least one of the top priorities of the, of the citizens of Dighton and the commission as well, historical commission. Yeah. I, I firmly agree with that. And, and one of the things that this program wants to do, in addition to any other outreach that, that any agency in town can do, is to reach out and bring the children into what goes on in town. Mm -hmm. Whether it be learning about what the town officials are and what their jobs mm -hmm. entail, or how the highway department works, or why we have a tree warden, right. um, all of those things, and stepping back into history and actually sharing in something that actually happened mm -hmm. is a wonderful way to bring them aboard. And sometimes the best type of education is the one that you learn outside the school. Absolutely. So Absolutely. that's why we need, they need to take you know, yeah. field trips and yes. excursions yeah. to different historic sites and stuff. Well, I've, yeah. uh, I, I, about a year and a half ago, my sister and I put together a, a coloring book for children from four through fourth grade. And uh, we had a hundred of them made. And someone, well, actually Mrs. Goulart saw one of them at the arts festival a couple of years ago and was very interested. And the next thing I knew, the town had bought 50 books of their own wow. and they took them, put them in the library and they employed it in their young children's learning program. And I am now working on a, uh, an activity workbook for middle school 
age so that we have that level up to grade four and then I want something that goes right up to high school level and mm -hmm. then beyond that more. But so, so I'm trying really, really very much interested in bringing in the young people because that will keep the interest in our history oh, alive. Most definitely, no question, yeah. No yeah. question about that. Definitely. Um, is there anything else on yes. going? Yes. Uh -huh, I'm sure. <laughs> of course, the James Briggs House. Yes. Which is uh, right now is our, one of our top priorities. Uh, f for some of you may know, the, the town of Dighton recently acquired the property right next to the town hall, um, which is the James Briggs House, which I believe was built 1770? It, well, yeah. I think it was prior to 1770, yes. Prior to 1770. Yes. Yeah. So the town bought it. But um, people are wondering if the town has any intention of repurposing of re mm -hmm. or, re or reusing that house, maybe as a new public library. We don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, during the last town meeting, uh, during the, town, the last uh, selectman's meeting last Wednesday, they, um, I think they suggested that they might demolish it eventually because the town of Dighton, the townspeople, are adamant about paying, spending too much money and repairing the roof or whatever's necessary to. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. I've, been, I've been in the house, as you have. Yeah. Um, the roof was allowed to really let go and the dampness got in and the second floor has a mold problem. I understand there are some structural problems as well related to things like powder post beetles and so mm. forth, which happens in old houses. However, um, I, I'm also told by someone who knows structural engineering that that house is salvageable, mm -hmm. um, but it will come at a cost. There's no question about that. The townspeople did vote to buy it, and when a motion was made to appropriate, I believe it was $60,000, right. mm -hmm. to do the necessary repair to keep it so that ultimately we could use it, uh, that motion was never seconded. Mm -hmm. And so it never came to the town floor for discussion. But um, the, the fact of the matter is that, that the Board of Selectmen last Wednesday night did vote to raise that building, mm -hmm. which means that the uh, six-month demolition control bylaw mm -hmm. has already kicked in. And if we are to save that building, we have to do it within the next six months. And that Which would means be the to pretty much duplicate what we had done with the Nat House. Yes, yeah. yeah. That would that would be the charge to the historical commission and the people of the town if they want to save that piece of our history. I can take an old map of Route 138 um, as far back as well. I, I I won't put a time frame on it. But we have lost at least 9 to 11 homes 200 years old or more on Route 138 alone. And our character of our town is changing. And that's fine if, it, if we're progressing. But if we progress without looking back, we lose a lot. So, you know, I know that you're your focus is on, on trying to preserve what we can that we still have. Um, so I guess I would like to appeal to our viewers, if you are interested in taking this house, or if you know anyone who might be interested in taking this house, who loves preserving old houses, and who can afford to move the house to their property, please call me, <laughs> and we'll facilitate your visit to the house. Um, and do you want me to put your information on the, sure. on the Facebook sure. page? Please, okay. Please and, and actually, you, you, have a, you have a Facebook page I do. It's for... called Save the James Briggs House, which is on Facebook. It's an open public group, so anybody can join it, and anybody can read all the updates and, and the postings. So if you have a specific interest in the possibility of saving the James Briggs House, you need not be a current Dighton resident. Mm -hmm. uh, I have personally been contacted by a number of people who no longer live in Dighton, but are familiar with the house and its history, and they are very interested in, in seeing it saved, if it can be. Um, I would add just one footnote to that. The, the James Briggs house was built by the father of Stout George Briggs, 
and uh, Stout George Briggs was actually born in a house which his father owned and built across the street from that one. But that that house has a has a very long Dighton history, and there were two sons. The second son lived in the um, house which was almost directly across the street from that one, just a little farther to the north, which has recently been sold to a, to a new family. Um, so it, it has a connection. Anyway, Rafa, thank you very much. Have you um, anything else you'd like to add? No, I, thank you for inviting me to the show. I, I really had a good time. And you know, as, as a citizen of Dighton, I, I feel very proud to live here, to be, to be one, of, one of the guys, one of the citizens. We're very happy to have you with Thank us, you. believe me. Because I didn't expect to have a guest today, I did think I'd share a few reading opportunities for folks to consider if they wish to learn more about the town of Dighton and its area. First, I recommend Helen Holmes Lane's History of Dighton. It was printed in 1962 by the town, and it was compiled after years of research by a dear lady who was once my teacher, always my neighbor and a friend, and Dighton's first town historian. Next, there is a most wonderful book about a very interesting Dightonian named Roy Horton, his life and times living in the West Dighton and Rehoboth area. That book is Swamp Yankee, printed in 1994, and it was written by our Rehoboth neighbor, engineer, and great local historian, E. Otis Dyer. Then there is a wonderful photographic essay by the late Charles Turek Robinson, who left us far too young, and Frank DeMattis, called Images of America, Rehoboth, Swansea, and Dighton, printed in 1997. There are four chapters in this book that are devoted to Dighton, which is primarily photographs, so let's flip through it, with captions, so you can learn a great deal. And another book for you to consider reading, especially if you are interested in the history of the American Revolution, is The Literary Diary of Ezra Stiles, DD, LLD, Volume 2. It was written and covered the time period, it actually is his diary, covered the time period from March 14, 1776 to December 31st, 1781, and Dighton plays a big part in the story. It was published by Yale University in 1901, where Reverend Stiles became president after having lived and preached in Dighton and other places. It is a true day-by-day -day account of Ezra's life and times, included, including many war-related daily entries that involve the town of Dighton. Very, very interesting. If you're interested in local history, that is an excellent, excellent volume. Um, Ezra Stiles was the pastor of the Church of the Lower Four Corners for a time, and he lived in the Rufus Whitmarsh House on Elm Street, and he had been driven from his home in Newport by the British, and his friend, William Ellery, also driven from Newport by the British, came to live in that house with the uh, Stiles family, and he was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He was a representative of the, of the he was a Rhode Island representative to the, dec, to the Second Continental Congress in Philadelphia, and he made all of his trips on horseback from Dighton, Massachusetts to that Congress. Now, before I close, I promise a little did you know tidbit. About the building we are in, an interesting but little known piece of Dighton history with a tinge of fun shows the strong spirit of community that helped to build this wonderful old town. Here in the old town hall, originally called the new townhouse in 1869, which has just been renovated and repurposed for community use again, there are stories to be told, and this is the very first about this very building. It's a very old building, constructed 250 years ago in 1869, in September, in fact, during hurricane season. A town meeting vote in April of 1869 appropriated 3,500, yes, I did say 3,500, not $35,000, to build a new townhouse. 
and it also voted that it had to be completed by town meeting in October of the same year. That vote allowed for just six months for a site to be chosen, land purchased, plans to be drawn, materials obtained, site and construction work to be done and finished, and the building ready for use. Six months. And remember, there was no heavy equipment, nor were there any power tools. By September, construction was well underway and one wall had been completely erected. But, there's always a but, I'm told. Mother Nature stepped in with what was called the September Gale of 1869. When the workers returned to the building, that completed wall was on the ground, in pieces. Undaunted, they reconstructed and re-erected the wall, completed construction and finished the building, and it was open and ready for its first town meeting, which was held here early in October of 1869, within the six months, and it came in under the $3,500 budget. This little historic tidbit just goes to say that Daytonians are determined folks, and that tradition continues to this day. Well, that's all for this first program of 2019, folks. We'll soon be back on Community Corner, probably in a month, with a special guest or two. Remember, you can contact us on Community Corner Dighton as soon as I get it set up. Many thanks to my friend and Dighton's, Rafa Delphin, for joining us on such short notice and sharing with us so much information. We will welcome you back one day soon. I know, you you're better. back with us again. <laughs> <laughs> this is Myrna Santos saying so long for now from the community corner. As we take our leave, please always remember, one of the greatest gifts we can give is a smile. A smile costs nothing. So remember to keep smiling and sharing those smiles because smiles brighten everyone's day and everybody smiles in the same language.